Tijuana, Mexico, 1989. Two brothers take control of the city's drug trade. Using a network of tunnels, modified cars, boats, and planes, they flood the United States with cocaine. 20 to 30 tons of coke at the time. The operation is worth billions. For protection, the brothers recruit an army of American gangbangers. You got grenades, you have AK-47, as much uh, ammo as you want. When a rival cartel tries to take over, the result is war. The carnage claims thousands of lives. No one is safe, not even children. There's been bloody deaths for years. There's been people being beheaded and dissolved in acid. Mexican and U.S. law enforcement join forces to take the cartels down. But they're powerless to stop a wave of violence engulfing drug-infested Tijuana. February 7th, 1985, Guadalajara, Mexico. Outside the U.S. consulate, Enrique Camarena, an agent with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, is heading for his car. Suddenly, a group of armed masked men grab him. They force him into the back of a car and disappear. Agent Camarena, nicknamed Kiki, was in Mexico on special assignment investigating rumors of a secret deal between drug lords from Tijuana and Colombia. The Colombians, the world's biggest producers of cocaine, agree to pay Gallardo's cartel to smuggle their drugs into the United States. Lying just 15 miles south of San Diego, Tijuana is the world's busiest border crossing. 50 million people a year pass into California, the wealthiest U.S. state with the biggest market for illegal drugs. It's the obvious spot for the cartel to focus their drug shipments. The cartel stands to make millions, but they fear the DEA could destroy the Colombian deal. They need to find out what the DEA knows. One of the traffickers said, I know a DEA agent. I know he works at the consulate. I know what he looks like. I can, I can pick him up. Two days later, Camarena is dead. You know, somebody just throws the bodies out on the side of the road. The brazen killing is a sign of the high stakes. Butch Etheridge is with a team of FBI agents dispatched to Mexico to investigate Camarena's murder. He, he was beaten pretty brutally. And he suffered quite a bit. The, the final blow, we think, was a tire into his head. The killing triggers a massive manhunt for Camarena's killers. The U.S. government stops and searches every vehicle crossing the border and demands that Camarena's killers are brought to justice. After four years, the Mexican police parade this man in front of news cameras, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Mexico's first drug lord is sent to prison for life for the murder of Kiki Camarena. Gallardo's downfall in 1989 sees his business carved up. Two of his drug traffickers emerge as successors. Joaquin Chapo Guzman, seen here in rare footage shot in prison, gains control of Gallardo's business in Sinaloa. And the Ariano Felix brothers take control of his business in Tijuana. They were the nephews of Miguel Felix Gallardo. They had the network set up probably through Miguel Felix Gallardo. They were ruthless like that whole trafficking group were. The Ariano Felix brothers and Chapo Guzman worked together to maximize profits. They pooled their resources to make money from the cocaine trade that was now moving through Mexico almost entirely. The Ariano Felix brothers and Guzman have made Culiacan, the state capital of Sinaloa, their home. Sinaloa is the cradle of Mexico's drug business. Its fertile soil and warm climate is perfect for growing marijuana and heroin. Sinaloa's culture of lawlessness has also cultivated the vast majority of Mexico's drug lords. The Ariano Felix brothers move from Sinaloa to Tijuana. The DEA starts calling the Tijuana cartel 
the Ariano Felix Organization, the AFO for short. The two brothers who lead the AFO are Benjamin and Ramon. Benjamin is a natural businessman. You could just tell he was in charge. And never saw him carrying a weapon. Uh, he dressed with a suit like a businessman. Benjamin transforms the Tijuana drug trade by renegotiating the deal with the Colombians. Instead of just working for the Colombians by smuggling their cocaine across the border, they're now buying drugs from the Colombians and setting up their own distribution networks in the U.S. They're no longer the transporter for the Colombians, and they've, they've set up shop, and so they are more powerful than the Colombians in the United States. Steve Duncan is a federal agent who witnessed Benjamin Ariano Felix's entire reign as head of the cartel. He was truly the leader of the organization, and what Benjamin said, people did. Benjamin was, was ruthless. If anybody got in his way, you know, he was dead. While Benjamin transforms the Tijuana cartel's business, Ramon takes control of its security organization, revealing a gift for sociopathic violence. He was the, the, the person everybody feared in the other organizations. He was crazy and he was uh, unpredictable. And if he was after you, he's very persistent, very aggressive, and, he, and he, he wouldn't stop until he killed you. Miguel, a former AFO smuggler, barely survives his first encounter with Ramon when he foolishly helps himself to Ramon's drink. The first time I, I met him, we were drinking on the bar, and I grabbed the bottle, start drinking. Ramon suddenly pulls out his gun. He was gonna kill me, but there was another person there and said, you know what, he's friends of ours. Instead of killing Miguel, Ramon offers him a job. Soon, Miguel finds himself in charge of smuggling AFO drugs across the border. It was like a, like a supervisor of the drugs on Mexican side. At uh, the time, it was, they were talking about 20 to 30 tons of coke at the time. The AFO smuggles drugs into the U.S. by road across the border, by boat along the Pacific coast, and even through miles of cleverly constructed tunnels that run from Tijuana under the border guard's feet and into the U.S. By 1992, the insatiable demand for cocaine among American drug users allows the AFO to increase revenue from $360 million per year to a staggering $7 billion per year. To protect this lucrative business, the AFO are prepared to kill anyone who stands in their way. You have to be aware about all the cops. If someone tries to pull you over, you have to be ready to get in a shooter. Brutality and death is at the heart of the AFO culture. Drug traffickers, banished by the Catholic Church, turn to the satanic cult of Santa Muerte, the Mexican angel of death. They show their devotion to Santa Muerte by emblazoning their bodies and guns with images of death. The citizens of Tijuana fear the powers of this cult. Everybody pray that the Santa Muerte don't kill you. That's normal people. But the drug lords, they sacrifice to the Santa Muerte. It's like a god. Devotees kill others as an act of reverence. For the AFO, killing is like a religious requirement. They behead, they do everything they do, you know, a lot of rituals to the Santa Muerte. By leaving sacrificed, headless bodies on the city streets, the AFO strikes terror into the heart of Tijuanans. The cops are powerless to stop the AFO. But another threat emerges. Relations between the AFO and Chapo Guzman break down. Guzman is jealous of the AFO domination of Tijuana, Mexico's most profitable smuggling route. Personal beefs began to happen, uh, selfishness. Chapo Guzman started to fight against the Ariano Felix organization. By destroying the peace, Chapo Guzman becomes the Ariano Felix brothers' deadliest enemy. Uh, they always said that um, 
Chapo was a lot more powerful, more, probably better connected. That's why they wanted him killed. War between the former allies seems inevitable. Ramon Ariano Felix sets out to establish a new armed force capable of defeating Chapo Guzman. His strategy is to recruit Americans who are able to carry out hits in Mexico without being recognized by either the Mexican cops or the rival cartels. But first he needs an American to lead this force. Two AFO traffickers serving time in U.S. federal prison meet the perfect candidate. David Barone, the leader of San Diego's 30th Step Street Gang. He endeared himself to these two fellows while in federal prison. And when he got out of prison, he had an invite to work for the, for the Ariano Felix organization as an enforcer. Barone accepts the offer and heads to Mexico as soon as he leaves prison. November 8th, 1992. Out of the blue, Chapo Guzman proposes negotiations to avoid war. He invites Ramon to a meeting on neutral territory at the tourist resort of Puerto Vallarta, 1,200 miles south of Tijuana. Ramon, wary of Guzman's intentions, takes Barone along for protection. The meeting goes well. The two sides agree not to go to war. Afterwards, Ramon feels like celebrating. After the meeting in the evening, the Ariano Felix brothers were at Christine's discotheque. Christine's is a popular night spot. The brothers are unaware they've walked into a carefully prepared trap. Chapo Guzman paid off the police, go to the other side of town. As the brothers party, Guzman and his heavily armed assassins enter the club determined to wipe them out. As Chapo Guzman came in and stormed the club, His men were, were spraying people with automatic weapons and killing people. The AFO's newest recruit is the first to react. David Barone picked up an automatic weapon and sprayed suppression fire. Outnumbered and outgunned, Barone manages to fight off the assassins and get the brothers out of the nightclub. Barone's reputation within the AFO is sealed. David's is a folk hero with the Ariano Felix brothers because that one event. Ramon has found the man to lead his new American army. David was a one percenter. He was that one percent of the gang that was a leader, that was ambitious, that was deadly, that was crazy, and people look up to him. Ramon orders David Barone to travel to San Diego to recruit Americans. The timing couldn't have been better. The San Diego police have been busting Logan Heights gangbangers, and those not in prison are on the run, looking for a place to hide. Most of the sales and uh, trafficking in the neighborhood stopped because of all these operations. I'm, I was on the run, and I was hoping to do something uh, that wasn't going to land me in prison. Approximately 40 members of the Logan Heights street gangs moved to Tijuana to escape American justice by joining the AFO. We went to down south to Tijuana. Once we were there, we were told that we are being recruited to, to be a security for someone very important in Tijuana. The U.S. gang members are put up in middle-class areas. The houses were elegant, nice, nice homes uh, in suburbs of Tijuana. The Americans are trained in the use of high-caliber weapons by Ramon. Ramon uh, is a big showboat where he uh, always offered to take a group out to a ranch and, and go train. We had boxes of ammo, you know, all in big wooden crates, and it was just as much as you wanted to shoot. The AFO's state-of-the-art weapons are purchased from gun dealers in the U.S. Allá le venden armas a, a, tranquilamente a cualquier persona, ¿no? Entonces todo el armamento que hemos asegurado nosotros aquí en, en Tijuana, todo viene de Estados Unidos. January 1993, Ramon's American troops are trained and equipped, ready to go to work. 
Their first job is securing the AFO's home base, the streets of Tijuana, searching for AFO's enemies. I would say, hey, hey guys, uh, check out that uh, red car, keep an eye on them pull the vehicle over because our, our vehicles were rigged up with uh, sirens and just like federal agents. We wore bulletproof vests, we had uh, handcuffs. I mean, we looked like, like military uh, federal agents. Dressed and equipped as federal agents, the AFO roamed the streets of Tijuana at will. Pull a you know, car over and I jump out and pull them out and uh, frisk them, make sure that they had no weapons. There was a time uh, they found a weapon on somebody. They, all, they took them away, uh, you know, to interrogate them. May 1993, eight months after the disco ambush in Puerto Vallarta, Ramon Ariano Felix is ready to take revenge against Chapo Guzman. Ramon assembles a hit team from his new recruits. News reaches him that Chapo Guzman is in Guadalajara, a major city 1,200 miles southeast of Tijuana. Ramon, David Barone, and about 15 to 20 enforcers from Tijuana travel to Guadalajara to look for and to kill Chapo Guzman. The hit team spends two weeks fruitlessly searching for Guzman. Finally, they get some news. There was some intelligence that Chapo Guzman was arriving at the Guadalajara airport in a white grand marquee. Ramon's assassins descend on the airport. They set up an ambush to kill Guzman. As a white Grand Marquis came into the lot, it was fired upon. Hundreds of, of rounds fired at the Grand Marquis. Ramon's men are convinced they have wiped out their arch rival. Logan Heights gang members accompanied by Ramon, got on the plane, flew back to Tijuana, believing they were successful. Following day in the morning, one of the guys had information through David Barron that something went bad. The gunmen have made a terrible mistake. The man in the white marquee is not the drug lord Chapo Guzman, but Cardinal Juan Jesus Posadas, Archbishop of Guadalajara. In Mexico, 90% of the population is Roman Catholic. The killing of a high-ranking cardinal sparks a national outrage. This time, no amount of silver or lead can get the AFO out of trouble. From that point on, they became you know, public enemy number one in, in Tijuana. Because if anything is held sacred in Mexico, it's, it's the Catholic religion. Ramon Ariano Felix is indicted for drug trafficking. He immediately goes into hiding. The police launch a manhunt. Benjamin secretly goes to see his political contacts to take the heat off his brother Ramon. Together, they hatch a plan for two AFO recruits to take the rap for the murder of the Catholic Cardinal. Benjamin orders David Barone to select two men. Two of the gang members uh, turn themselves in because David had asked them to. The two men make the call to the cops. The remaining American recruits learn about loyalty Mexican style. And the killing of the cardinal happened, and, you know, like reality just set in, you know, he started really, damn, you know, you know how they asked for two people to turn themselves in, and um, how easily uh, your life is just uh, at their disposal, whatever they want at any minute. Uh, you know, if they feel you're a threat to them, uh, they'll kill you and your whole family. The national outcry following the assassination of the Cardinal emboldens the Mexican authorities to move against the cartels. On June 9th, 1993, Chapo Guzman is arrested and sent to federal prison on drug trafficking charges. Presidential candidate Luis Colosio campaigns to wipe out the drug cartels. With Colosio ahead in the polls, the AFO decide to act. 
March 23rd, 1994. Thousands of Colosio supporters throng the Lomas Torinas Barrio, unaware that a killer lurks among them. Suddenly, a handgun appears in the crowd, inches from Colosio's right temple. Colosio drops to the ground. The crowd quickly swarms around the gunman. There's no escape route. The killer has sacrificed his freedom at the AFO's bidding. The high-profile assassinations of a Mexican cardinal and a presidential candidate are the last straws for the Mexican government. Aware that their own police force is unable to beat the AFO, the Mexican authorities turn to the United States for help. The U.S. government, alarmed by the rising tide of smuggled drugs, agrees to help. In January 1995, President Clinton orders the establishment of a dedicated task force. Special Agent Steve Duncan is one of the first to join. We, we formed the Ariano Felix Drug uh, Task Force to fight the organization. And our goal was to dismantle the organization. The poorly paid and poorly equipped Mexican police no longer have to fight alone. Now America's finest law enforcement officers are given the task of taking down the Ariano Felix brothers. To succeed, they'll have to defeat Mexico's most formidable criminal organization. They had 500 people working for them on a daily basis on the streets uh, to patrol Tijuana to keep the enemies out, to dispatch hit teams into the United States and other part of Mexico to, to eliminate and, and, and battle their foes. March 1995, Tijuana, Mexico. Led by brothers Benjamin and Ramon, the Ariano Felix organization has bribed and murdered its way to the top of the Mexican drug trade. With an annual income of over $7 billion and an army of ruthless killers, the brothers have the money, manpower, and influence to challenge the authority of the Mexican state itself. The U.S. government responds to this threat on its border by establishing a dedicated AFO task force. Its mission? To target AFO operatives in the U.S. while building indictments against the cartel's leaders in order to prosecute them before U.S. courts. Traditionally, U.S. law enforcement has relied on witnesses from within organized crime to provide incriminating evidence. In the case of the AFO, finding people prepared to talk, let alone testify in open court, seems impossible. It's very difficult to develop and nurture and maintain a witness because the Arano Felix organization rules through torture tactics. Unable to directly recruit informants, the task force relies on people coming to them. August 1987, out of the blue, the FBI in Los Angeles gets a call from a man offering his services as an informant. He has a connection through marriage to Luis Armando Valenzuela, who the feds believe is the head of a drug trafficking family from Sinaloa. The FBI seizes the opportunity. They put the informant on the payroll and give him the code name Cyclone. The FBI asked me to compile information on the family if I could find. Months go by before he has any contact with the Valenzuelas. Then one day, the phone rings. Louis's brother was on the line with an unusual request. One of his brothers had been killed uh, with a shootout with the local police department in a drug deal. And I was asked to help get the body back to Mexico. Cyclone seizes the opportunity. He arranges for the body to be released from U.S. custody and brought back to Mexico for burial. Cyclone is invited to the funeral. He begins overhearing the traffickers' conversations. There was talk of drugs. There was talk of uh, retaliation for the death of the brother. There was even vendettas wrote on the concrete that was poured over the casket. Cyclone gets closer to Luis Armando Valenzuela and is invited to his wedding, where he discovers Valenzuela is a member of the AFO. One of the Felix brothers came to the reception. The entire place went into an uproar. This man had a lot of guards with him. He 
Paid his respects, stayed a little while, had something to eat. We all ate together at the same table, and he left. Unaware that his brother-in-law is an undercover operative, Valenzuela begins to bring him into the business. The pair watch the border, noting the patrol patterns of the U.S. border guards. It was not uncommon for uh, Armando to sit in an office building that overlooks the border, making notes. Cyclone gets an insider's view of how the traffickers operate. They know exactly what's going on at that border, and their, their common thing is uh, 300 kilos of cocaine in a car, and they'll throw 10 or 15 cars at the border. One or two will get caught. The AFO never takes a holiday. Christmas is the ideal time to get their vast profits back across the border. Christmas weekend, law enforcement is on a, is on a, a skeleton crew. They send kids across with, with Christmas packages, with backpacks, and it's all full of money. January 1997. Cyclone gets a call. On the line is one of Valenzuela's brothers who needs Cyclone's help with something big. One of the cartel brothers approached me and it was time to avenge his brother's death. He wanted me to help him locate the police officer who was involved in the shooting. The AFO plans to assassinate the U.S. police officer that killed Valenzuela's brother. When I brought that to the attention uh, of the FBI and the DEA, I said, you know, this is serious now. March 1997. The FBI decides the time has come to move against Luis Armando Valenzuela. With no jurisdiction in Mexico, the Fed set up a sting operation to get Valenzuela onto American soil. Cyclone contacts Valenzuela and tells him he has a contact in the U.S. who wants to buy a large amount of cocaine. But Valenzuela doesn't take the bait immediately. Instead, he invites Cyclone over to a Mexican warehouse he owns to discuss the matter. Cyclone arrives at the appointed time not knowing what to expect. He's led to a small room where he sees a badly beaten man. Valenzuela tells Cyclone the man is an informant. And he was an informant for one of the drug agencies here in the United States. It was pretty obvious to me that this man wasn't going to be leaving. He, he was beat up pretty bad. Valenzuela hands Cyclone a loaded gun and tells him to execute the man. Cyclone faces a terrible choice. He either commits murder or blows his cover and gets killed himself. He raises the gun. At the very last moment, a hand grasps his arm. One of the brothers stepped in and said, never mind, we, we know you will do it. Cyclone leaves the room. The bound man is not so lucky. We heard some shots going off. I don't believe the guy ever made it out of the warehouse. It's a shocking moment, but Cyclone's finally won Valenzuela's confidence. The sting is back on track. Valenzuela agrees to accompany him to the U.S. 28th of August, 1997. On a yacht moored in Marina del Rey, Los Angeles, the pair meets up with Cyclone's contact, FBI undercover agent Victor Guerrero. The informant set the stage by indicating that I was a uh, future buyer from the city of Chicago. And he was very anxious to find uh, new buyers for his product, particularly someone that's going to be taking in huge quantities. Valenzuela takes the bait. He agrees to sell the undercover agent cocaine. We agreed I would pay a certain price in California, I believe it was $12,000 a kilo, or $15,000 a kilo delivered in Chicago. Valenzuela tells Guerrero that he'll deliver the first consignment of drugs to Cyclone in California. The meeting was set up at a truck stop in Ontario, California, one of the biggest truck stops in the United States. The FBI take up positions at the truck stop, waiting for Valenzuela to show. Hours had gone by, and finally I got a phone call from Armando. Said he apologized, couldn't make it. He got delayed someplace, he'll try and come and see me in a couple days. Disappointed, Cyclone gets up to leave. I got up from the table, and I started out towards where my vehicle was parked. 
As I went through the back door of the exit of this big truck stop, somebody touched me on the back. I turned around, it was Armando. Cyclone realizes if he had made contact with the FBI in the parking lot, he would be dead. Because he had been in that parking lot all evening watching me. That's how careful this man is. Finally convinced Cyclone is alone, Valenzuela hands over the drugs. The FBI decides to wait, hoping it will lead to a bigger bust. The agents let Valenzuela walk. They get a wiretap authorization and start listening into his calls. Within days, they have wiretaps on much of his U.S. distribution network. The breadth and scope of the organization was tr truly, truly revealed during the utilization of federal wiretaps. The agents listen in as suppliers and distributors discuss drug deals. So what you over here is conversation between two people discussing the movement of product or the remittance of money that's going back to Mexico. Over the next nine months, agents, with information from the wiretaps, confiscate nearly four tons of cocaine and arrest 55 AFO drug dealers. The wiretaps also reveal that Luis Armando Valenzuela's immediate boss is Jorge Castro, an AFO top lieutenant who answers directly to Benjamin. 26th of June, 1998. The wiretap team learns that Jorge Castro is in Los Angeles. The FBI decides to pounce. Agents swoop on a number of houses across Southern California. They arrest Jorge Castro and five members of his distribution network. The feds recover $15 million in cash and close down one of the AFO's principal drug distribution networks. The bust is a life-changing moment for Cyclone and his family. His cover is blown. The affidavits of search warrants had my name plastered all over. The FBI arranged for Cyclone and his wife to go into hiding. It's only a matter of time before Valenzuela discovers who has betrayed him. We had to move out of our house. We had to quit our jobs. We lost a home. To this day, Cyclone fears for his life. Luis Armando Valenzuela was never arrested. He's still being hunted by the AFO task force, who believe he's still trafficking drugs from his home in Mexico. While the FBI is running the cyclone sting, across the border in Mexico, there's a dramatic turn of events. February 20th, 1997. Mexican President Zedillo responds to widespread accusations of collusion with the drug cartels by sending federal troops into Tijuana to confront the AFO. The army floods the streets with soldiers, sets up roadblocks, conducts house-to-house -house searches, and makes a number of arrests. They were doing a lot of damage to the Arianos, arresting a lot of their people. David Barone, the AFO's chief enforcer, is so outraged by the Mexican army being in Tijuana that he decides to take matters into his own hands. He finds out the whereabouts of the commanding major's girlfriend. David Barone uh, walked into a restaurant where the, the Mexican army major's girlfriend worked, grabbed his girlfriend by the head and assassinated her, her there in broad daylight. No witnesses come forward and no action is taken. Barone has just shown he's bigger than the Mexican army. In March 1997, the Mexican police arrest a senior army officer for taking bribes from the AFO. Hopelessly compromised, the army pulls out of Tijuana. In the ensuing confusion, Barone takes the opportunity to exact revenge on local journalist Jesus Blancornelis who has named and shamed David Barone as the AFO's top enforcer. David Barone took it personally and he followed uh, Jesus Blanc Cornelis around. Thanksgiving Day, 1997. Barone strikes. He and a hit squad box in Blanc Cornelis's car in the middle of a street. David Barone, wearing a bulletproof vest and, and, and holding a 12-gauge shotgun, exited the vehicle, was approaching Blanc Cornelis because he wanted Blanc Cornelis to see him as he executed him. Barone's men opened fire on the car. 
their bullets strike Blanc Cornelis, but also find an unintended target. One of the rounds from David's men fragmented it, hit him in the left eye and killed him on the, on the street corner. And uh, it's a classic photo where, where David healed over with a shotgun and bled out there on the curb. Barone dies from friendly fire. He always knew he would leave Mexico in a coffin. He himself said, I, I have no way out. If I ever go down, I'm going to go down shooting. But not like this, shot down by his own men. The accidental death of David Barone shakes the AFO to the core. When you kill one of those one percenters, one of the very violent types that people follow around like the David Barone, you really knock the wind out of the organization and a lot of people are no longer that fearful. Many of Barone's American recruits flee back across the border and agree to give information to the San Diego task force. We got a lot of people coming forward and we got a lot more co cooperation at the time. September 1998. With the AFO losing leaders and recruits, Chapo Guzman's Sinaloa cartel piles on the pressure by recruiting AFO traffickers to work with them. When Ramon Ariano Felix discovers that Fermin Castro, a low-level marijuana smuggler, has switched allegiance to the Sinaloa cartel, he sends a warning to anyone else thinking of leaving the AFO. Late at night, gunmen enter Castro's house and exact a terrible punishment. The gunmen force Castro to watch as his family is dragged from their bed, herded up against a wall, and shot. Among the dead are a baby and seven children between the ages of two and 16. In the end, the death squad also slays Castro. It's more than a punishment. It's a brutal atrocity. But the killers have achieved Ramon's goal. To send a very, very powerful message to anyone else thinking of becoming an informant, that only is their demise imminent, but that of their entire family will follow suit. The Fermin Castro massacre reaffirms the AFO's ironclad grip on Tijuana and its control of the world's most lucrative drug smuggling routes. But Benjamin and Ramon Ariano Felix's reign of terror is threatened by events unfolding across the border and the escape from jail of their deadliest enemy, Chapo Guzman. Tijuana, 2002. Benjamin and Ramon, leaders of the Ariano Felix organization, have dominated drug trafficking through this Mexican city for 13 years. But they've lost their chief enforcer, and with him, much of the American muscle that guaranteed their position as Tijuana's drug kingpins. Now they face a new threat. The flow of cash is suddenly turned off in the aftermath of 9-11. In response to jihad terrorism, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security reinforces points of entry along the length of the U.S.-Mexican border. Border guards discover the AFO's network of underground tunnels and closes them down. Estados Unidos sella su su, su frontera. Hace muy 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 duro el, el cruce. Y esto eh, eh, pone en alto riesgo los grandes cargamentos que iban. The impact on the AFO drug business is devastating. While Benjamin and Ramon have no choice but to wait for relaxed border restrictions, their arch rival, Chapo Guzman, who escaped from jail in January 2001, outmaneuvers them. He floods the cities of northern Mexico with cheap synthetic drugs, instantly creating a new mass market for the poor. La droga era un, era una, un asunto elitista, ¿no? para cierto nivel económico. Este, cuando viene la droga sintética, el ice, es cristal, el polvo de ángel, ¿no? Entonces, se vuelve de nivel social bajo. Pues. While Benjamin's sources of income dry up, Guzman is making a fortune. The corrupt politicians of Tijuana have no loyalty other than to money. Many now shift their allegiance from the AFO to Guzman. Guzman uses these newly established political relationships to deliver an ultimatum to Benjamin. 
close down your smuggling operations into the United States, or we will kill Ramon. I was present when they told Benjamin, you're not to allow to move coke. If you move coke, Ramon will get killed. The brothers refuse to bow to Guzman's threats. There's no way Benjamin or Ramon will give up their lucrative drug business. Ramon decides to hunt down and kill Guzman and all his top men. That was one of the biggest reasons he started a rampage killing everybody. But the odds are stacked against them. The Rayano Felix organizations by themselves against all the drug cartels and all the, the government. All the drug lords tried to kill them. Ramon knows the only chance he has of surviving Guzman's onslaught is to go on the offensive. On February 10th, 2002, Ramon and two hitmen travel to the town of Mazatlan in Sinaloa to kill Guzman's partner, Ismael Zambada Garcia. Before they get to Zambada's house, they're stopped by local cops. Ramon claims he's an undercover federal agent. He took out his police credentials. Ramon's fake badge doesn't fool the cops. A state cop told him they were a fake. Uh, Ramon pulled out his gun and shot the cop in the head. The other cops return fire. And then Ramon was killed, either by the cop that he shot or other police officers at the scene. Ramon Ariano Felix, the cartel's fearsome general, has died as he lived at the point of a gun. Miguel believes Ramon was the only person who could protect the AFO from rival drug lords. When Ramon got killed, I, I got out from the country of Mexico because I knew that the war was finished. The killing of Ramon is clear evidence that the once tame police are now set on dismantling the AFO. The Mexican police took the telephones, took whatever evidence they could on Ramon at the scene of the killing. Using the evidence taken from Ramon's dead body, the Mexican cops move against the Ariano Felix head, Benjamin. A month after his brother's killing, the cops swoop down on his house as a kid is dropping off cash. With no security present to protect him, Benjamin is quickly subdued and immediately transferred to a high security federal prison. Dragged from the criminal underworld, Benjamin is processed in front of the full glare of Mexican TV cameras. Benjamin and Ramon Ariano Felix, the founding brothers of the AFO, are no longer Tijuana's drug lords. It was a breath of fresh air for us, and it was finally some success. And from that point in 2002, um, we've been beating down the Ariano Felix organization. Leadership of the AFO passes to Eduardo Ariano Felix, who has neither the charisma nor experience of his brothers. We still have Eduardo, who at the time we think is a recluse who is, uh, maybe has a wire loose in his head. Chapo Guzman believes the time is right to destroy the AFO. His gunmen descend on Tijuana. But Guzman has underestimated the strength of the AFO. They are embedded in the city and refuse to give up their turn. The brutality on both sides has no limits. Con una hazaña tremenda, ¿no? este, eh, quemados, eh, descuartizados, decapitados, como una intención de intimidar al bando contrario, como hacen los, los, los perros cuando enseñan los colmillos. ¿no? The remnants of the AFO fight Chapo Guzman Sinaloa cartel for five years. The war becomes increasingly savage. In three months, 300 cartel members and cops are killed on Tijuana's streets. 37 in a single weekend, nine by decapitation. Tens of thousands of Tijuanans give up on the city and head for the United States, refugees from a drug war that has no end in sight. October 25th, 2008. The Mexican Federal Police get a break. Following a tip-off from the U.S. Task Force, they swoop down on a house in an upscale area of Tijuana. The occupant is none other than the remaining Ariano Felix brother, Eduardo. Refusing to surrender, he opens fire on the police.
After a ferocious gun battle, Eduardo was captured and flown directly to the federal prison in Mexico City. Now, all the Ariano Felix brothers are either in prison or dead. After 14 years, the task force has achieved its declared goal of removing the Ariano Felix brothers from the streets of Tijuana. But there's no hope this will stop the killing. The cartels have been fighting each other for 20 years. And there's so much bad blood and so much negative history among the cartels that it is going to continue. The war between the drug cartels has claimed in excess of 16,000 lives in Mexico. Now, the killing is spilling over the border into the United States. There's a stretch of highway that goes from Phoenix, Arizona to Mexico. They've been finding body parts out there, a hand here, a foot here, a head here, and they have, I don't know how many different unidentified bodies. The dead, who continue to pile up on either side of the border, are gruesome proof that taking down the Ariano Felix brothers hasn't stopped the torrent of drugs flowing from Mexico into the United States. Americans consume $40 billion worth of drugs every year, 90% of which come through Mexico. Mexicans will tell you really fast, you know, Mexico does not have a drug problem. It's America has a drug problem because we're the one that have the appetite for the drugs. And they have a point there, a very good point. As long as the drug trade continues, the people of Tijuana will live with death, destruction, and despair.